This video is for Night by Ellie Wiesel, Chapter 3, Part 1, which is the first nine pages of this chapter. So if you look at the chart on this slide, we've got the information given and the annotations required. There is a statement made on the first page, men to the left, women to the right. When you come to this statement, I want your reactions, thoughts, and or questions to the, state, the statement itself and statements and events after this. There are also um, two examples for sure of small kindnesses that we'll see in this um, the first part of this chapter. So what I want you to answer is one, identify the small kindnesses that we notice and two, I want you to be able to um, express the impact that these small kindnesses have for Ellie and his father. The third thing that I want you to look at and make annotations over um, is the changes in Ellie Wazell's faith. So I want you to look at how his faith changes in the first part of this chapter. Okay, and remember, I will guide you. You can pause this video as you need to and then you know continue when you're ready so don't let my speed put you put you behind okay go at your own pace okay i'm going to begin reading now the beloved objects that we carried that we had carried with us from place to place were now left behind in the wagon and with them finally our illusions think about that remember when they were in the ghetto it said that the ghetto was ruled neither by German nor Jew, but by delusion, right? So now Ellie Wiesel is um, acknowledging that now their illusions, their delusion has been left behind with all of those physical belongings, okay? Every few yards, there stood an SS man, his machine gun trained on us. Hand in hand, we followed the throng. An SS came toward us, wielding a club. He commanded, men to the left, women to the right. So here's that statement that I told you to look out for, right? So what do you think the purpose of them separating the men from the women is, right? We don't know yet, but there is a purpose. So what do you think that that is? Eight words spoken quietly, indifferently, without emotion. Eight simple short words. Look at that sentence. Eight simple short words. Is it an actual sentence? Does it have a subject and a verb? Is it a complete thought? I want you to write something about that down. Okay, highlight that sentence. Make a note by it. We are going to come back to that in class. Okay, so even if you're doing the guided readings, I'm going to give you information that is not on the chart that will benefit you for in-class discussion. So pay attention to those hints as you go through the video. Yet that was the moment when I left my mother. There was no time to think, and I already felt my father's hand press against mine. We were alone. Alone in with, they came with 80 people, right? But we know there are more once they got there, but yet he makes a statement, we were alone. In a fraction of a second, I could see my mother, my sisters, move to the right. Zipporah was holding mother's hand. I saw them walking farther and farther away. Mother was stroking my sister's blonde hair as if to protect her, and I walked on with my father, with the men. I didn't know that this was the moment in time and the place where I was leaving my mother and Zipporah forever. I kept walking, my father holding my hand. So I want you to think about this word forever and what it really means and what does it mean here. And I want you to just jot some notes about that. Okay, what is your thought on that? Okay, next page. Behind me, an old man fell to the ground. Nearby, an SS man replaced his revolver in its holster. My hand tightened its grip on my father. All I could think of was not to lose him, not to remain alone. The SS officers gave the order, 
form ranks of fives. There was a tumult. It was imperative to stay together. Hey, kid, how old are you? The man interrogating me was an inmate. I could not see his face, but his voice was weary and warm. Fifteen? No, you're eighteen. But I'm not, I said. I'm fifteen. Fool, listen to what I say. Then he asked my father, who answered, I'm fifty. No, the man now sounded angry. Not fifty. You're forty. Do you hear? Eighteen and forty. Okay, so why is this inmate trying to help him, do you think? Okay, you can highlight um, pieces of evidence here for your reaction, right? And why is this going to be important later on, do you think? Okay, I'm going to continue. He disappeared into the darkness. Another inmate appeared, unleashing a stream of invectives. Sons of, why have you come here? Tell me why. Someone dared to reply. What do you think? That we came here of our own free will? That we asked to come here? The other seemed ready to kill him. Shut up, you moron, or I'll tear you to pieces. You should have hanged yourselves rather than come here. Didn't you know what was in store for you here in Auschwitz? You didn't know? In 1944? True, we didn't know. Nobody had told us. He couldn't believe his ears. His tone became even harsher. So let's go back to chapter one. Okay, and and there how life kept returning to normal, right? Things would happen, life would return to normal. They would forget. They didn't want to believe things that they heard. But we know there was no talk that they heard of um, the crematorias, right? We know we didn't we didn't hear about that, right? Moish the beetle gave a lot of um, a lot of evidence in his story that told them they should leave, right? They should do something, and they didn't, right? But what were the other signs that they should have paid attention to? Think about those things, right? And But if you think about, too, the, the technology that was available and the way news traveled and the pace that it traveled, and, I mean, how could they have known? Right, but this inmate, he's like in 1944, right? It's been going on, we know, for at least four, almost five years that they have been bringing the Jews into the concentration camps. So he's like, How do you not know this already? Like, right? So now we'll continue. He says, Over there, do you see the chimney over there? Do you see it? And the flames, do you see them? Yes, we saw the flames. Over there, that's where they will take you. Over there will be your grave. You still don't understand, you sons of. Don't you understand anything? You will be burned, burned to a cinder, turned into ashes. His anger changed into fury. We stood stunned, petrified. Could this be just a nightmare? An unimaginable nightmare? I heard whispers around me. We must do something. We can't let them kill us like that, like cattle in the slaughterhouse. We must revolt. There were among us a few tough young men. They actually had knives and were urging us to attack the armed guards. One of them was muttering, Let the world learn about the existence of Auschwitz. Let everybody find out about it while they still have a chance to escape. But the older men begged their sons not to be foolish. We mustn't give up hope. Even now, as the sword hangs over our heads, so taught our sages. A sage is like um, a wise mentor. That's what uh, they're referring to. Uh, When I read this and, and hear them talk of revolt now at this time when they're at Auschwitz, right? Why didn't they talk about it back there in the ghettos? Uh, I'm thinking it would have been easier for them to revolt in the ghettos, but Why do you think they didn't, right? This is just another point for us to think about um, as we continue to read this story. Okay. Um, I'm going to continue. The wind of revolt died down. 
We continued to walk until we came to a crossroads. Standing in the middle of it was, though I didn't know it then, Dr. Mengele, the notorious Dr. Mengele. He looked like the typical SS officer, a cruel, though not unintelligent, face, complete with monocle, the one-eyed glasses. He was holding a conductor's baton and was surrounded by officers. The baton was moving constantly, sometimes to the right, sometimes to the left. In no time, I stood before him. Your age? he asked, perhaps trying to sound paternal. I'm 18. My voice was trembling. In good health? Yes. Your profession? Next page. Tell him that I was a student? Farmer, I heard myself saying. This conversation lasted no more than a few seconds. It seemed like an eternity. The baton pointed to the left. I took half a step forward. I first wanted to see where they would send my father. Were he to have gone to the right, I would have run after him. The baton once more moved to the left. A weight lifted from my heart. When I read this sentence, I made an annotation just recording my own reaction to this right, that I'm so glad that they moved together so that Ellie did not feel alone, which is one of the things he was worried about in, you know, the second page of this chapter. We did not know as yet which was the better side, right or left, which road led to prison and which to the crematoria. Still, I was happy. I was near my father. Our procession continued slowly to move forward. Another inmate came over to us, Satisfied? Yes, someone answered. Poor devils, you are heading for the crematorium. He seemed to be telling the truth. Not far from us, flames, huge flames, were rising from a ditch. Something was being burned there. A truck drew close and unloaded its hold. Small children. Babies. Yes, I did see this. With my own eyes. Children thrown into the flames. Is it any wonder that ever since then, sleep tends to elude me? Right When we see this statement, when we read this statement right here, we know that even though this whole experience changed him, this moment right here had a profound change on him as well. And it's important to note that and write that down In my book, I underlined the phrase, sleep tends to elude me, and just put a quick note, changed him, right? Because the changes that we see along the way in this memoir are important for us, right? Remember, you're going to write your own memoir at the end of this unit, and as you decide what you're going to write about, I want you to think about moments that where your audience is going to be able to see and you will be able to express when and where and how you were changed. Okay, I'm going to continue. So that was where we were going. A little farther on, there was another larger pit for adults. I pinched myself. Was I still alive? Was I awake? How was it possible that men, women, and children were being burned and that the world kept silent? No, all this could not be real. A nightmare, perhaps. Soon I would wake up with a start, my heart pounding, and find that I was back in the room of my childhood with my books. My father's voice tore me from my daydreams. Next page. What a shame. A shame that you did not go with your mother. I saw many children your age go with their mothers. His voice was terribly sad. I understood that he did not wish to see what they would do to me. He did not wish to see his only son go up in flames. Okay, look. Um, this part right here, okay, when we go back to the first page when it says, men to the left, women to the right, okay? And then we're looking at events that happen after this, right? We still see the continued separation, right? It's constantly to the left or to the right. Next phase, you're going this way, you're going that way. But we know from his first statement that where his mother and his sisters went, um, 
he, it's a good thing that Ellie Vazell did not go there or we wouldn't have the story that we're reading, right? But this statement, he did not wish to see his only son go up in flames. So we know that tells us, and we don't know if Ellie knew that then or if this is a reflective statement to where now he knows, right, He what happened with his mother and his sisters. And so as he makes the statement, is it because, you know, is it reflective or is it he realized in that moment? Okay. All right. I'm going to continue. My forehead was covered with cold sweat. Still, I told him that I could not believe that human beings were being burned in our times. The world would never tolerate such crimes. The world? The world is not interested in us. Today, everything is possible. Even the crematoria. His voice broke. Father, I said, if that is true, then I don't want to wait. I'll run into the electrified barbed wire. That would be easier than a slow death in the flames. He didn't answer. He was weeping. His body was shaking. Everybody around us was weeping. Now, if you if you think back to how Ellie Vazell described his father in chapter one, right? He described him as cultured, unsentimental. He did not display his feelings and he cared more about the welfare of others than that of his own kin. We see repeatedly why Ellie Vazell setting that impression of his father up in chapter one like that is important even now, right? Because we see him weeping. His body was shaking. Here, he cannot contain his emotions, right? So every, and it says everybody around us was weeping. Someone began to recite Kaddish, the prayer for the dead. I don't know whether during the history of the Jewish people, men have ever before recited Kaddish for themselves, right? So that they, so this telling us they knew now that they were going to die probably, okay? Um, I do not know how to say the Kaddish, but I'm going to give it my best shot here. Yizkadal Ve'ezkadash Shmei Raba. May his name be celebrated and sanctified, whispered my father. For the first time, I felt anger rising within me. Why should I sanctify his name? The Almighty, the eternal and terrible master of the universe, chose to be silent. What was there to thank him for, right? So I want you to highlight here because we see him questioning his faith right now. When he had been so devout up until this point, right? But now we see him. Why should I sanctify his name? He chose to be silent, right? So this is important to note, right? In the information given, I put the changes in faith. This is where we see that explicitly mentioned. We continued our march. We were coming closer and closer to the pit from which an infernal heat was rising. 20 more steps. If I was going to kill myself, this was the time. Our column had only some 15 steps to go. I bit my lips so that my father would not hear my teeth chattering. 10 more steps. Eight, seven. We were walking slowly as one follows a hearse our own funeral procession. Only four more steps. Three. There it was now, very close to us, the pit and its flames. I gathered all that remained of my strength in order to break rank and throw myself onto the barbed wire. Deep down, I was saying goodbye to my father, to the whole universe, and against my will, I found myself whispering the words, Yiskadal ve'eskadash mei rabba. May his name be exalted and sanctified. My heart was about to burst. There, I was face to face with the angel of death. No, two steps from the pit, we were ordered to turn left and herded into barracks. I squeezed my father's hand. He said, do you remember Mrs. Schachter in the train? Think about that. Highlight that line. Right? In your chapter two annotations, you were supposed to bet, why do you think she saw the flames before there was any evidence of the crematorium? How do you think she saw that? Okay. 
Okay, I'm going to continue. Never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp, that turned my life into one long night, seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the small faces of the children whose bodies I saw transformed into smoke under a silent sky. Never shall I forget those flames that consumed my faith forever. There we have another mention of a change in his faith right there. Never shall I forget the nocturnal silence that deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments that murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to ashes. Never shall I forget those things, even were I condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. The barrack we had been assigned to was very long. On the roof, a few bluish skylights. I thought, this is what the antechamber of hell must look like. So many crazed men, so much shouting, so much brutality. Dozens of inmates were there to receive us, sticks in hand, striking anywhere, anyone, without reason. The orders came. Strip! Hurry up! Rouse! Hold on! Only to your belt and your shoes! Now, go back to this first sentence, right, where it says dozens of inmates were there to receive us, striking, sticks in hand, striking anywhere, anywhere, anyone, without reason. So these inmates are fellow Jews, right? So think about that, okay? All right, next. Our clothes were to be thrown on the floor at the back of the barrack. There was a pile there already. New suits, old ones, torn overcoats, rags. For us, it meant true equality, nakedness. We trembled in the cold. A few SS officers wandered through the room, looking for strong men. If vigor was that appreciated, perhaps one should try to appear sturdy. My father thought the opposite. Better not to draw attention. We later found out that he had been right. Those who were selected that day were incorporated into the Sonder Commando, the commando working in the crematoria. Bella Katz, the son of an important merchant of my town, had arrived in Birkenau with the first transport one week ahead of us. When he found out that we were there, he succeeded in slipping us a note. He told us that having been chosen because of his strength, he had been forced to place his own father's body into the furnace. The blows continued to rain on us. I can't even imagine what that young man, what that was like for him, right? But here we see a second example of kindness in that he warned them. He didn't have to warn them. Nobody warned him, right? He had to find out the hard way, but he shows kindness to, um, to Ellie and his father so that they can make a better choice. Now, one of the things you can link that back to is possibly Ellie Vazell's status in the community. It says he was highly esteemed, he was respected, and people, all of them, sought his advice. So maybe that is why um, Bella Katz returned that he was returning a favor because of who he was, okay? The blows continued to rain on us. To the barber! Belt and shoes in hand, I let myself be dragged along to the barbers. Their clippers tore out our hair, shaved every hair on our bodies. My head was buzzing the same thought surfacing over and over, not to be separated from my father. Freed from the barber's clutches, we began to wonder about the crowd, finding friends, acquaintances. Every encounter filled us with joy. Yes, joy. Thank God, you are still alive. Some were crying. They used whatever strength they had left to cry. Why had they let themselves be brought here? Why didn't they die in their beds? Their words were interspersed with sobs. Mia, we let the dogs in. Sorry, my dogs are barking. Suddenly, someone threw his arms around me in a hug. Yehil, the Segeter Reb's brother. He was weeping bitterly. I thought he was crying with joy at still being alive. Don't cry, Yehil, I said. Don't waste your tears. Not cry. 
we're on the threshold of death. Soon we shall be inside. Do you understand? Inside. How could I not cry? I watched darkness fade through the bluish skylights in the roof. I was no, I no longer was afraid. I was overcome by fatigue. The absent no longer entered our thoughts. One spoke of them. Who knows what happened to them? But their fate was not on our minds. We were incapable of thinking. Our senses were numbed. Everything was fading into a fog. We no longer clung to anything. The instincts of self-preservation, of self-defense, of pride had all deserted us. In one terrifying moment of lucidity, I thought of us as damned souls wandering through the void, souls condemned to wander through space until the end of time, seeking redemption, seeking oblivion, without any hope of finding either. So, sorry, my dogs are so loud. As I read this, there are several things that um, that I notice and that I've underlined in my book, right? Those two sentences, I no longer was afraid. I was overcome by fatigue. So can you think of any time in your life where, um, where you were so exhausted, emotionally exhausted or mentally drained, right? That you can't, you can't feel, you can't react because you are so overcome. You're so fatigued. Um, think about that. That's going to be important in the class discussion. Okay. And then another thing, um, that I underlined those sentences, we were incapable of thinking our senses were numbed. Everything was fading into a fog. We no longer clung to anything. The instincts of self-preservation of self-defense of pride had all deserted us, right? So everything now is gone. We talked about that hope that they had before, right? Where is that now? Is that gone? We will, we will find out, right? But as of right now, they are just drained. Okay. I also put at this point, we know they are naked. They have been shaved. They have been stripped and separated and gone through all of these things, right? So they have been stripped of dignity. They have been stripped of their humanity, right? Treated like animals right now. Um, I made that comment in my book that they have been stripped of dignity and humanity. Okay, I'm going to continue. Around five o'clock in the morning, we were expelled from the barrack. The capos were beating us again, but I no longer felt the pain. A glacial wind was enveloping us. We were naked, holding our shoes and belts. An order, run! And we ran. After a few minutes of running, a new barrack. A barrel of foul-smelling liquid stood by the door. Disinfection. Everybody soaked in it. Then came a hot shower, all very fast. As we left the showers, we were chased outside and ordered to run some more. Another barrack. The storeroom. Very long tables. Mountains of prison garb. As we ran, they threw the clothes at us. Pants, jackets, shirts. In a few seconds, we had ceased to be men. This is an important sentence here, right? In a few seconds, we had ceased to be men. I want your reaction to this. I want you to highlight this sentence, underlined it, underline it, okay? Had the situation not been so tragic, we might have laughed. We looked pretty strange. Meerkats, a colossus, wore a child's pants and stern, a skinny little fellow was floundering in a huge jacket. We immediately started to switch. I glanced over at my father. How changed he looked. His eyes were veiled. I wanted to tell him something, but I didn't know what. The night had passed completely. The morning star shone in the sky. I, too, had become a different person. The student of Talmud, the child I was, had been consumed by the flames. All that was left was a shape that resembled me. My soul had been invaded and devoured by a black flame. So here we have another instance where he refers back to his faith, right, with Talmud. Okay, so that's an important thing to highlight and then make a note about his faith at this point in time. 
So many events had taken place in just a few hours that I had completely lost all notion of time. When had we left our homes? And the ghetto? And the train? Only a week ago? One night? One single night? How long had we been standing in the freezing wind? One hour? A single hour? 60 minutes? Surely it was a dream. Okay, I am going to stop there for the end of chapter three, part one. Chapter three, part two, we'll pick up with the last half of this page. Okay, this is the guided reading video for chapter three, part two in night by Ellie Wiesel. So I am picking up on the last page, the, the last half of page nine in your book. So chapter three has a total of 20 pages. I'm on the last half of page nine in chapter three. Okay, remember my book has different page numbers as um, than yours. Okay, so the annotations and the information that we are looking for in chapter three, um, part two, we're looking at, we are learning about life in the camp. Okay, so I want you to record your reactions, thoughts, or questions about what life was like in the camp. Um, we're going to hear some words of wisdom from other um, prisoners in the camp. So I want you to find the words of wisdom in this part of the chapter. And I just want you to highlight them. You can put your reactions or your thoughts about them. But mainly I'm going to be looking that you have highlighted them and you can identify them quickly. Okay. The last thing that we're looking at, again, changes in faith. So I want you to highlight the references to his faith, and annotate how it continues to change. That's what we're tracking right now. Okay, I am going to go ahead and start reading. Remember, you can pause the video and restart as you need it. Go at your own pace. Okay, starting with not far from us. So I'll give you a second to find that spot in your book. Not far from us, prisoners were at work. Some were digging holes, others were carrying sand. None as much as glanced at us. We were withered trees in the heart of the desert. If you want to underline that or highlight it, it, that is a metaphor. So figurative language. You're going to have to use figurative language in your summative writing. Behind me, people were talking. I had no desire to listen to what they were saying or to know who was speaking and what about. Nobody dared raise his voice, even though there was no guard around. We whispered perhaps because of the thick smoke that poisoned the air and stung the throat. We were herded into yet another barrack inside the gypsy camp. We fell into ranks of five. So remember, we learned that the Nazis not only targeted the Jews, but they also targeted the gypsies and handicapped people and other populations that they decided were not part of or could not be a part of the, the German master race or follow the German ideas. Okay, so we fell into ranks of five. Next page. And now, stop moving. There was no floor, a roof and four walls. Our feet sank into the mud. Again, the waiting. I fell asleep standing up. I dreamed of a bed, of my mother's hand on my face. I woke. I was standing, my feet in the mud. Some people collapsed, sliding into the mud. Others shouted, are you crazy? We were told to stand. Do you want to get us all in trouble? As if all the troubles in the world were not already upon us. Little by little, we all sat down in the mud. But we had to get up whenever a capo came in to check. Uh, came in to check if, by chance, somebody had a new pair of shoes. If so, we had to hand them over. No use protesting. The blows multiplied. And in the end, one still had to hand them over. I had new shoes myself. But as they were covered with a thick coat of mud, they had not been noticed. I thanked God in an improvised prayer for having created mud in his infinite and wondrous universe. Okay, if you look at that reference to his faith right there, I thanked God in his infinite and wondrous universe. Right, so that's quite a change from what we... Um, heard him say in the first part of chapter three, right? So I would highlight that, okay? And how is this different than what he was feeling before? Take a minute, make that annotation, highlight that phrase, those words, those keywords, 
Okay, I'm going to continue reading. Suddenly, the silence became more oppressive. An SS officer had come in, and with him, the smell of the angel of death. We stared at his fleshy lips. He harangued us from the center of the barrack. You are in a concentration camp in Auschwitz. A pause. He was observing the effect his words had produced. His face remains in my memory to this day. A tall man in his thirties, crime written all over his forehead and his gaze. He looked at us as one would a pack of leprous dogs clinging to life. Remember, he went on, remember it always. Let it be graven in your memories. You are in Auschwitz, and Auschwitz is not a convalescent home. It is a concentration camp. Here, you must work. If you don't, you will go straight to the chimney, to the crematorium. Work or crematorium, the choice is yours. We had already lived through a lot that night. We thought that nothing could frighten us anymore. But his harsh words sent shivers through us. The word chimney here was not an abstraction. It floated in the air, mingling, mingled with the smoke. It was, perhaps, the only word that had a real meaning in this place. He left the barrack. The capos arrived, shouting, All specialists, locksmiths, carpenters, electricians, watchmakers, one step forward. The rest of us were transferred to yet another barrack, this one of stone. We had permission to sit down. A gypsy inmate was in charge. My father suddenly had a colic attack. He got up and asked politely in German, Excuse me, could you tell me where the toilets are located? The gypsy stared at him for a long time, from head to toe, as if he wished to ascertain that the person addressing him was actually a creature of flesh and bone, a human being with a body and a belly. Then, as if waking from a deep sleep, he slapped my father with such force that he fell down and then crawled back to his place on all fours. I stood petrified. What had happened to me? My father had just been struck in front of me, and I had not even blinked. I had watched and kept silent. Only yesterday, I would have dug my nails into this criminal's flesh. Had I changed that much? So fast, remorse began to gnaw at me. All I could think was, I shall never forgive them for this. My father must have guessed my thoughts, because he whispered in my ear, It doesn't hurt. His cheek still bore the red mark of the hand. Okay, I want to go back um, to the top of this page where it says the word chimney here was not an abstraction, right? So he's acknowledging the chimney, right, is a physical thing. And he says that it's the only word that had a real meaning in this place. So just think about that. I want you to record your thoughts for that, okay? Okay. Um, we have not necessarily words of wisdom, but basically the angel of death tells them work or crematorium, the choice is yours, right? So I would highlight that, okay? He makes it seem very simple as to how all of this works, right? Then later, they call out all the specialists, okay? And they separate them all again. So here we have another separation, okay? Another thing on this page is where he says, I had watched and kept silent, right? I just want you to highlight that phrase, kept silent, okay? We're going to come back to that in class, all right? Um, so life in the camp so far is hard, right? So we don't really know what the day-to-day -day is like, but we're kind of getting an idea of how things are working. So if you see anything on these last two pages that stand out to you that you want to um, record your thoughts or reactions to, um, go ahead, pause and do that now. Okay, I'm going to keep reading on the next page. Everybody outside! A dozen or so gypsies had come to join our guard. The clubs and whip whips were cracking around me. My feet were running on their own. I tried to protect myself from the blows by hiding behind others. It was spring. The sun was shining. Fall in, five by five. The prisoners I had glimpsed that morning were working nearby. No guard in sight, only the chimney's shadow. Lulled by the sunshine and my dreams, I felt someone pulling at my sleeve. It was my father. 
Come on, son. We marched. Gates opened and closed. We continued to march between the barbed wire. At every step, white signs with black skulls looked down on us. The inscription? Warning. Danger of death. What irony. Was there here a single place where one was not in danger of death? The gypsies had stopped next to a barrack. They were replaced by SS men who encircled us with machine guns and police dogs. The march had lasted half an hour. Looking around me, I noticed that the barbed wire was behind us. Excuse me. We had left the camp. It was a beautiful day in May. The fragrances of spring were in the air. The sun was setting. But no sooner had we taken a few more steps than we saw the barbed wire of another camp. This one had an iron gate with the overhead inscription, Arbe macht frei. Work makes you free. Auschwitz. Okay, think about that. I underlined that statement in my book, Work Makes You Free. Okay, look, is there anything here that you wanted to um, react to that wasn't on um, the slide, I would go ahead and do that now. Okay, next page. First impression, better than Birkenau. Cement buildings with two stories rather than wooden barracks. Little gardens here and there. We were led toward one of those blocks. Seated on the ground by the entrance, we began to wait again. From time to time, somebody was allowed to go in. These were the showers, a compulsory routine. Going from one camp to the other, several times a day, we had each time to go through them. After the hot shower, we stood shivering in the darkness. Our clothes had been left behind. We had been promised other clothes. Around midnight, we were told to run. Faster, yelled our guards. The faster you run, the faster you'll get to go to sleep. After a few minutes of racing madly, we came to a new block. The man in charge was waiting. He was a young Pole who was smiling at us. He began to talk to us, and despite our weariness, we listened attentively. Comrades, you are now in the concentration camp Auschwitz. Ahead of you lies a long road paved with suffering. Don't lose hope. You have already eluded the worst danger, the selection. What is the selection? Think back to the selection. Okay, make some annotations here. This refers to life in the camp, how the camp works. Therefore, muster your strength and keep your faith. We shall all see the day of liberation. Have faith in life, a thousand times faith. By driving out despair, you will move away from death. Hell does not last forever. And now, here is a prayer, or rather a piece of advice. Let there be camaraderie among you. We are all brothers and share the same fate. The same smoke hovers over all our heads. Help each other. That is the only way to survive. And now, enough said. You are tired. Listen, you are in Block 17. I am responsible for keeping order here. Anyone with a complaint may come to see me. That is all. Go to sleep. Two people to a bunk. Good night. Those were the first human words. Okay. This whole paragraph right here, we have the words of wisdom. Okay. From... Someone who is unidentified at this time, all we know is he was a young Pole, right? So he was from Poland. Um, but look at those words. And then I want you to look at how the sentence structure changes towards the end of this paragraph. That is all. Go to sleep. Two people to a bunk. Good night. Right? And then his Ellie's statement, those were the first human words. What does that mean? Right, so think about that. Um, we will discuss this paragraph in class on um, Friday, Thursday or Friday, whichever day you have me. Okay, and next page. No sooner had we climbed into our bunks than we fell into a deep sleep. The next morning, the veteran inmates treated us without brutality. We went to wash. We were given new clothing. They brought us black coffee. We left the block around 10 o'clock so it could be cleaned. Outside, the sun warmed us. <laughs> Our morale was much improved. A good night's sleep had done its work. Friends met, exchanged a few sentences. We spoke of everything without ever mentioning those who had disappeared. The prevailing opinion, 
was that the war was about to end. Still that hope, right? At about noon, we were brought some soup, one bowl of thick soup for each of us. I was terribly hungry, yet I refused to touch it. I was still the spoiled child of long ago. My father swallowed my ration. We then had a short nap in the shade of the block. That SS officer in the muddy barrack must have been lying. Auschwitz was, after all, a convalescent home. In the afternoon, they made us line up. Three prisoners brought a table and some medical instruments. We were told to roll up our left sleeves and file past the table. The three veteran prisoners, needles in hand, tattooed numbers on our left arms. I became A7713. From then on, I had no other name. Okay, that's important. Life in the camp, right? He is no longer Ellie, Eliezer. He is A7713, right? So they've already been stripped of their clothes, their possessions, their family, their freedoms, and now they take their name. Okay? At dusk, a roll call. The work commandos had returned. The orchestra played military marches near the camp entrance. Tens of thousands of inmates stood in rows while the SS checked their numbers. After the roll call, the prisoners from all the blocks dispersed, looking for friends, relatives, or neighbors among the arrivals of the latest convoy. Days went by. In the mornings, black coffee. At midday, soup. By the third day, I was eagerly eating any kind of soup. At six o'clock in the afternoon, roll call, followed by bread with something. At nine o'clock, bedtime. We had already been in Auschwitz for eight days. It was after roll call. We stood waiting for the bell announcing its end. Suddenly, I noticed someone passing between the rows. I heard him ask, who among you is Wiesel from Siget? The person looking for us was a small fellow with spectacles and a wizened face. My father answered, That's me, Bazel from Siget. The fellow's eyes narrowed. He took a long look at my father. You don't know me? You don't recognize me? I'm your relative, Stein. Already forgotten? Stein. Stein from Antwerp. Riesel's husband. Your wife was Riesel's aunt. She often wrote to us and such letters. My father had not recognized him. He must have barely known him, always being up to his neck in communal affairs and not knowledgeable in family matters. He was always elsewhere, lost in thought. Remember, in chapter one, he tells us his father was always more, he always cared more for others than of his own kin. Okay, so here's another, another part that he brings that up and reiterates that. Once, a cousin came to see us in Siget. She had stayed at her house and eaten at her table for two weeks before my father noticed her presence for the first time. No, he did not remember Stein. I recognized him right away. I had known Rizel, his wife, before she had left for Belgium. He told us that he had been deported in 1942. So he has been there for two years already. Okay, Ellie Wiesel and his family have been there for eight days. He said, I heard people say that a transport had arrived from your region and I came to look for you. I thought you might have some news of Rizal and my two small boys who stayed in Antwerp. Next page. I knew nothing about them. Since 1940, my mother had not received a single letter from them. But I lied. Yes, my mother did hear from them. Rizal is fine. So were the children. He was weeping with joy. He would have liked to stay longer to learn more details, to soak up the good news, but an SS was heading in our direction and he had to go, telling us that he would come back the next day. So why did Ellie Vazell, why did he lie to him? Just think about that, okay? The bell announced that we were dismissed. We went to fetch the evening meal, bread and margarine. I was terribly hungry and swallowed my ration on the spot. My father told me, you mustn't eat all at once. Tomorrow is another day. But seeing that his advice had come too late and that there was nothing left of my ration, he didn't even start his own. Me? I'm not hungry, he said. We remained in Auschwitz for three weeks. 
We had nothing to do. We slept a lot in the afternoon and at night. Our one goal was to avoid the transports, to stay here as long as possible. It wasn't difficult. It was enough never to sign up as a skilled worker. The unskilled were kept until the end. At the start of the third week, our Blockletesta was removed. He was judged too humane. So the Blockletesta, that was the, um, the guy that came and gave them their first human words. That's who he was. The new one was ferocious and his aides were veritable monsters. The good days were over. We began to wonder whether it wouldn't be better to let ourselves be chosen for the next transport. Stein, our relative from Antwerp, continued to visit us, and from time to time he would bring a half portion of bread. Here, this is for you, Eliezer. Every time he came, tears would roll down his icy cheeks. He would often say to my father, Take care of your son. He is very weak, very dehydrated. Take care of yourselves. You must avoid selection. Eat anything, anytime. Eat all you can. The weak don't last very long around here. And he himself was so thin, so withered, so weak. The only thing that keeps me alive, he kept saying, is to know that Rizal and the little ones are still alive. Were it not for them, I would give up. One evening he came to see us, his face radiant. A transport just arrived from Antwerp. I shall go to see them tomorrow. Surely they will have news. He left. We never saw him again. He had been given the news. The real news. Okay, if you notice, when he has this sentence, he left, it stands alone. It's its own paragraph. Okay, just those two words. He left. Why do you think that is? What purpose does that serve? Okay, be prepared. I would make some annotations, highlight that sentence. That is something we're going to discuss in class on Thursday or Friday. Okay, I'm going to continue reading. Evenings. As we lay on our cots, we sometimes tried to sing a few Hasidic melodies. Akiba Drumar would break our hearts with his deep, grave voice. Some of the men spoke of God, his mysterious ways the sins of the Jewish people, and the redemption to come. As for me, I had ceased to pray. I concur. I concurred with Job. I was not denying his existence, but I doubted his absolute justice. Okay, there is a reference to his faith, right? He is acknowledging here, right? He's not denying that God exists, but he is doubting God's justice when it if you know anything about the Bible, Job kind of wrestled with God because he had everything and then everything was taken away. And in the story, um, God has allowed um, Job to be tested, right? And so he kind of argues with God throughout the, his trials, right? But he never denies his existence throughout the whole thing. Right, so that's the, the Job reference, if you didn't understand that one. Okay, I'm going to continue reading. Akiba Drummer said, God is testing us. He wants to see whether we are capable of overcoming our base instincts of killing the Satan within ourselves. We have no right to despair. And if he punishes us mercilessly, it is a sign that he loves us that much more. Hirsch Janud, well-versed in Kabbalah, spoke of the end of the world and the coming of the Messiah. From time to time, in the middle of all that talk, a thought crossed my mind. Where is my mother right now? And Zipporah. Mother is still a young woman, my father once said. She must be in a labor camp. And Zipporah, she is a big girl now. She too must be in a camp. How we would have liked to believe that. We pretended for what if one of us still did believe, right? So where are Zipporah and his mother, right? You need to, to know that. We can infer where they went. All the skilled workers had already been sent to other camps. Only about a hundred of us simple laborers were left. Today, it's your turn, announced the block secretary. You are leaving with the next transport. At 10 o'clock, we were handed our daily ration of bread. 
a dozen or so SS surrounded us. At the gate, the sign proclaimed that work meant freedom. We were counted, and there we were, in the countryside on a sunny road, in the sky a few small white clouds. We were walking slowly. The guards were in no hurry. We were glad of it. As we were passing through some of the villages, many Germans watched us, showing no surprise. No doubt they had seen quite a few of these processions. On the way, we saw some young German girls. The guards began to tease them. The girls giggled. They allowed themselves to be kissed and tickled, bursting with laughter. They all were joking. They all were laughing, joking, and passing love notes to one another. At least during all that time, we endured neither shouting nor blows. After four hours, we arrived at the new camp, Buna. The iron gate closed behind us. Okay, with the end of chapter three, right, if we look at, if we compare the end of chapter two, okay, which was we had arrived in Birkenau, okay, and then the end of this chapter, the iron gate closed behind us, right? After four hours, we arrived at the new camp, Buna. The iron gate closed behind us. So if you look at the difference in the punctuation used in this sentence versus the end of chapter two, okay, what do we have there? I want you to compare those two sentences, right? So we've got a colon after we arrived at the new camp, Buna, the iron gate closed behind us. But as we analyzed in class, right, the with we had arrived, period, in Birkenau, right, that gave us a completely different mood and tone than now this sentence does. So think about that because we will analyze that in class on Thursday or Friday as well. Okay, thank you for watching. I hope this helped you. Um,